Good evening. Hello, everybody. Um, and thank you for joining this uh, fabulous youth briefing. Um, we've been um, enjoying the challenges of the digital world so far this evening, and we're having a few bumps in the road um, in getting everybody onto the right side of the screen. So um, we're just going to improvise a little bit whilst we're hoping that some of our fabulous young people from Participation People may still be able to get onto the call. Otherwise, we know you're on the other side and um, we, we've got some questions already crafted from you and uh, good, good challenging ones they are. And we've got a good group of people here uh, to, to talk through those questions. So I'm just going to introduce us quite quickly and then come over to your questions because that's what's really important for us tonight is to be able to think together about some of the challenges for young people in this you know, extraordinary year. I'm sure we'll all look back on it as one of the most difficult years of our lives, but also potentially one of the most intriguing and interesting and one of the ones that will shape us to the future. So I'm Teresa Levy. I'm Executive Director for People and Children in Dorset and uh, been working with lots of participation people colleagues along the last few months. I'm going to hand over to Andrew Parry, if I might, and then Andrew, if you can introduce yourself and then introduce uh, the other panel members, that would be lovely. Hello, good evening. I'm Councillor Andrew Parry and I'm the Cabinet Member responsible for Children's Services, which includes education, uh, early help and skills. Um, very delighted to be with you this evening. Thank you for taking the opportunity to log on and join us for what I hope will be an interesting, informative uh, discussion tonight. Uh, I'd like to take a moment to introduce you to Dr Forbes Watson, who we, I'm sure would like the opportunity to introduce himself and tell you a little bit about his background. OK, th thank you, Andrea. Good evening um, I, and thank you for inviting me. I, I am a general practitioner in Lyme Regis in West Dorset and I am the chair of the Dorset um, Clinical Commissioning Group. I'll pass now on to uh, Rachel Partridge. Hello, I'm Rachel Partridge. I'm Assistant Director for Public Health at Public Health Dorset. And this is my first event of this, of this nature, so yeah, thank you for letting me part, be part of it. And now I'll hand over to Miriam. Hi everybody, um, my name is, I'm Miriam Lee and I'm the Principal Educational Psychologist in Dors for Dorset Council. Thank you, thank you all very much. So we, we really are very blessed with having a fantastic panel this evening, lots of expertise and experience from across the health and local authority network. So we're hoping to be able to provide some, some good responses to the fabulous questions that have been presented to us from young people, really wanting to help us to think with them about a range of issues. So I think the best way for me to um, make sure that you can hear the young people's voices is to tell you about a question from Georgia, age 17. And Georgia has asked us, I understand that socialising and education is important, but if people are being told to work from home, why are schools still open? In 2009, I believe it was, the government had pandemic training. And the one thing they all agreed on was that keeping schools open was the worst thing you could be doing. So why are they still open? I wonder to answer the beginning of that question, could I come to Rachel from a public health perspective? Yes, of course. Uh, and really important question and, and it, one that's been very much a live discussion and point all the way through this pandemic in terms of understanding our response. Um, the government in the, the published winter plan has made it really clear that this is a really important trade off um, and it's felt absolutely necessary that it's the importance of, of protecting education and in terms of people's life chances, students and, and older people's life chances in terms of getting good access to education. Schools provide a huge amount of, of input, both both from an uh, education perspective, but also the well-being of, of students. Um, the planning that was referred to was very much linked to, to planning for pandemic flu. And obviously we're learning a lot from, from the impact of COVID-19. The, the impact on the health of young people is, is much less severe. In fact, most young people uh, um, barely notice if they do have symptoms at all. So in terms of the impact on, on young people's health, it's, it's a lot less 
serious, but the impact on people's uh, young people's well-being if it's impacted on education is thought to be much, much worse. Obviously, this is an ongoing um, review, an ongoing situation, and I know the Department for Education is going to be reviewing the, the, the measures in place for for those areas in, in, in higher tiers, for example. So, so planning for mitigation if, if it were to be necessary to close schools. But that's very much seen as a, as a very extreme, um, unli unlikely situation. So lots of work going on. And obviously, schools are working really, really hard. You guys will be much better and more familiar with the, the mitigations that have gone into place. There's huge amounts of planning to make the environment as COVID secure as possible. So all sorts of work's gone on to at all levels of education to make sure that that learning environment is as safe as possible from a disease transmission point of view, whilst maintaining all the benefits that there are of, of young people being in school, getting education and all that support from, from seeing their friends and learning. Thank you, Rachel. So thank you, Rachel, that's a really helpful answer around our schools. And if I might, I might just stay with you before we um, uh, move on to other members of the panel, because I think you're right, the um, the opportunities in school to make that COVID secure has been really well thought out with many of the schools. And I know from talking to lots of young people, they felt quite safe returning to school. And we've been delighted to see over 95% of children back in school since September. But I wonder if you could just remind us a little bit about how we're working to remain, because Charlie, aged 15, asks us, what are we doing about remaining, uh, managing social distancing in the community? Again, really, really good and important question. The, the whole thing about our response to COVID-19 is that this is a huge a huge and complex response because we're learning all the time. So it, it, it's, it's absolutely impacted on the way we've lived our lives in, in a whole range of ways. And really interestingly, and from a public health perspective, it's, it's been really fascinating because we've had to go back to basics. So the, the messages that we have, the, the, the tools that we've had to prevent this disease spreading and, and, and the, all the negative impacts of people catching this disease have been going back to the basics of good hygiene around um, washing hands, about maintaining social distance and keeping space. And more recently, there's been the introduction of the, of the measures around face coverings in inside places. So it's been a really um, rapidly evolving picture, understanding what best and how best to support people to effectively protect themselves and protect the, the wider community from transmitting this, this infection. So as was pointed out in the question, some of those key um, tools that we have is around encouraging people to maintain social distance. And there's been lots of discussion around two metres versus one metre. Um, and and f as, a, as a key start, there's this, this a big multi-agency response in Dorset working to translate all the, the national messages and all the research and evidence that's coming out rapidly. Um, the key piece of work that we've been doing locally is trying desperately to engage with our with our local residents, with ourselves, with colleagues about reiterating the importance of these really key simple messages around hand washing, around maintaining social distance, keeping space, not having big gatherings. Um, so we're looking for all sorts of ways of communicating and, and being clear about those messages and why it's important. Um, we've been trying to use trusted voices. So, you know, instead of the prime minister giving an announcement and obviously he, he garners quite a big audience, but actually much more relevant to, to people locally is getting trusted people that, that people feel comfortable and understand, you know, why we need to maintain distance. So, so lots of work around communication and being clear about the reasons and the purposes for doing so. Um, also, you will be very aware if you go into the towns, there's been lots of work done to help support local businesses and to help the local high street. So, so colleagues across the local authorities working in regulatory services have been he there helping businesses to put in signage, the clarity about um, you know, queuing systems to make it as COVID secure as possible and really supporting businesses to be able to do that so they, they can operate whilst protecting their customers. 
which is a, is a really important tension and, and balance we have to make. And then probably at the far end of the spectrum, if, if all that fails, um, there's also the enforcement and the engagement and enforcement age. So, so we have got um, powers, there are powers, and, and the government's been very clear about the need to maintain distances and being COVID secure, and it's been increasingly um, put in place regulations. So, for example, we have um, COVID marshals that are around to help remind people and engage people. Um, and at a very last extreme uh, enforcement will be taken if people do breach or there's evidence of, of you know, a flagrant disregard, you know, but, but what we're trying to do is collectively as a population, we're, we're all in this together. We're trying to engage and trying to explain why it's important um, and prompts and signs and, and, and signage helps. But really, it's, it, it, it's down to us all to support each other. Um, but there is enforcement if absolutely necessary. Thankfully, we haven't seen much need from that. And we'll be aware of some, but but yeah, the, the vast majority of the population, we're trying to do our best, aren't we? Right. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Um, that's that's a really, really helpful um, and, and broad answer, which is great. And I think um, we know that lots of young people have found it uh, sometimes a bit contradictory around, you know, I'm in a bubble in school, I can meet with people in a classroom, but then if I'm outside, that doesn't quite equate the same. But I think I've managed that incredibly well. And we've worked really, really well together, I think, to avoid any of that enforcement. We know that it's tempting to go out to a party. We know it's tempting to get involved in the music scene because we've all missed it. Um, we all, we're all desperately keen to get out and, and have some of that great fun and enjoyment. But I also know, and just from talking with so many of our Dorset young people, how much they value, respect and, and care about their elderly folk and, and vulnerable people in the community and wanting to protect from that. And I think our figures have remained you know, very reassuringly low, which is great. And I think that's all about how well so many people, including our young people, have managed those, those constraints, really. I'm going to be coming to you now in a moment, um, Councillor Parry, uh, to answer the next question. So you might want to put your camera on so then you can pick up the next point. Um, Jade, 17, again asks a question that we're all really keen to know the answer to. Thinking about travel and going somewhere warm and sunny, I just had to put the beach, the deck chairs behind me today just to imagine that thought of being somewhere far away. But if we did go abroad now, would we have to quarantine when we return to the UK? And if so, for how long? And is there any way to prevent this? Andrew Powie. Thank you. What a fantastic question. And, uh, and one that's got a number of component parts to it that we all need to understand. So as the restrictions are currently in place until the 2nd of December, travel uh, outside of the, the UK is really for the purposes of the business uh, or for education or those that are other legally defined as, as essential travel. Um, once we go beyond there, we are entering that that uh, area where you are going to be expected uh, to self isolate for 14 days after returning on a trip uh, from abroad. Um, and I'd also suggest that you be very mindful of the regulations specific to the place that you are traveling to, because different countries will have different regulations in place and you need to be mindful of those restrictions as well. So yes, when you return to the UK, there is that period of 14 days of self-isolation that you need to be mindful of and factor that into your arrangements. Um, and obviously, if there's any suggestion that you have uh, any sort of symptoms as a result of that, then, then clearly you must make arrangements to get yourself tested uh, at the earliest opportunity and, and report those findings. Um, what we have seen in cases and we did see coming off the back of the summer in particular was was that instances of COVID case confirmed cases were being reported from those who had traveled abroad and were returning to the UK. So it really is important that you do follow those uh, uh, requirements. Um, I like you would welcome the opportunity to see travel again uh, and I do appreciate that for many of us 2020 has not been a great year in terms of broadening our horizons with uh, international travel. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Andrew Parry. That's a really helpful answer. And I think we do, yes, we all know it's been difficult and we know that particularly for young people, that year of travel 
is always a missed year, but it, you know we're, we're, we're getting there, folks. We can see the light at the end of the tunnel, I think. But for some people, that tunnel has been a very dark and difficult place, and, and the, the experience of being in lockdown or, or being in a place of uh, quarantine or a place of anxiety has created really significant challenges for them in terms of their emotional well-being. And Ollie, aged 18, asks us the question, how do you plan on helping the young people who have developed mental health problems during the pandemic? And I'd like to come to Miriam for a response, if I might. Yeah, that's a, a really, really good question. Um, and, you know, very true to my heart. Um, and it, we know, we, we, we know that mental health is important for all of us. Mental health sits with all of us. We all have mental health of some sort or another, and it's a continuum. And we, I mean, we're very aware. The government is very aware. There's been a lot of research, ongoing research during this pandemic, carried out by a range of different um, organisations, looking at that profile of mental health and the well-being of of young people, and particularly um, informing. The government around actually what do we need to do and they have from um, September they funded all local authorities to roll out a particular program called Wellbeing for Education focusing very much on schools and FE providers so further education as well so you know this, this question is from a young person who's 18 um, and of course you know that person as the people who are 18 are not likely to be in schools, but may well be in FE or could be in higher education. But if I just come back in terms of what we're doing around the, the school population up to that 18 population, is the Wellbeing for Education programme is very much designed for local authorities to then roll out some very good quality training which has been um, established by uh, the Anna Freud Centre, which is a very highly regarded organisation in London, the Tavistock um, Clinic, and is then being disseminated to local authorities and local authorities in, in Dorset and in BCP, we are linking up. So it's the Educational Psychology Service and Public Health that are rolling this out across all schools. And it's not just a one off training, it's a sustainable programme. So it's delivering training on wellbeing and mental health, supporting schools to think about how they identify that early on building resilience, so real focus on resilience and what are the factors that make young people resilient and, and not just about internal resilience, but what makes us resilience is the community around us and people knowing and understanding um, and being able to recognise and respond to our emotional needs as they arise. And that's what the emphasis is very much on that and support schools, which is where most young people are at the moment. That first question, <laughs> um, you know, raises that and and then also in order to identify it then it's also about how do we meet those needs and supporting schools to be able to meet those needs um identifying those triggers the, and identifying those factors at the right time in the right place and thinking about who's the best person to be able to support that young person um and the training then includes deliver a delivery of that sort of thinking about with our schools, how can we support them then get on on further on sustain that support? How do we support um, young people who may need further more specialist intervention and support? So we're working also with our mental health support teams, which are a, an early intervention uh, pr program, which was pre the pandemic. And the school had and it was part of the green paper for transforming mental health. And we have two areas in Dorset where we have mental health support teams in schools, where we have mental health practitioners working into schools, particularly around things like anxiety. And we also have our CAMS team working alongside us on this wellbeing for return. Um, and we want to, you know, really sustain this approach in schools. Schools have re really recognised the need and the community need within not just within the, the children actually but also with the staff and being able to support staff to be able to support young people um so you know that's where we're with that's the kind of approach that we're taking very much at a sort of community level thank you miriam um i wonder if i might come to um forbes uh, i'm wondering uh, dr forbes watson have you had concerns about the rise and concerns about young people. 
with mental health during this time? Uh, yeah, thank you, Teresa. Um, we, we we have indeed had concerns, um, um, particularly as the pandemic goes on, and um, as been mentioned earlier, we're, we're we're all feeling the effects on our mental health and and, and well-being um, as a result. Um, I think um, first and foremost, I would say that there are a number of areas of support available to young people. Um, across Dorset. So m my main message would be is do not suffer in silence. Support is available and it's really important that we hear from anybody with mental health issues, but particularly young people at this point in time. I, I would emphasise that for many people, the first point of accessing services, of course, is their general practice and general practice in Dorset are all open and uh, they are seeing people in a range of ways, which uh, can be by telephone, can be by an e-consult, or also can be face-to-face. -face. And we are seeing people face-to-face, -face, contrary to what um, uh, some reporting has, has said. General Practices offers an in-hour service between 8 a.m. and 6.30 p.m. during the working week. But of course, there's an out-of-hour service as well. Yeah. In terms of, um, I'm now getting an echo, but I'll, I'll keep talking. Um, in terms of uh, what wider uh, offers, is they, they, they come in different forms. So uh, we have 24, uh, seven, 24 hours per day, seven days per week crisis support through the connection service. And uh, that you can access that number online, but if, for anyone it's 0300 123 5440. Um, we um, also have um, development of a digital offer so that there are apps like Headspace uh, which are available. We've heard about support available in schools. There's access to Dorset Mind for young people which includes webinars and blogs and there's also a development of what's called a Discovery College in Dorset which is a project that combines the expertise of NHS healthcare professionals the lived experience of peer specialists and the voice of young people to create spaces to explore and share what mental health, recovery and well-being means. And it also offers digital workshops in a variety of topics. And one other area that has been very successful is access to online counselling and support through Couth, that's K-O-O-T-H um, and Chat Health. Um, which is specifically for those aged 11 to 19. So a number of access points to receive support. And again, I would just emphasise, do not suffer in silence. We really would like to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Really, really good and, and effective advice there. Uh, this is a time to talk. This is a time to reach out. This is a time to connect. And the people are there, people are still there and, and the help services are, are still absolutely stood up and, and wanting to hear from young people. The most important thing to do right now is to reach out. So and, and there are a range of things that um, trouble young people and one of the things certainly for, um, for early aged 18 um, is around her experience of having funded education. And she asked us this question, will there be any compensation for students who have invested lots of money in their education, only for the vast majority of it to be online virtual learning? Now, as you all know, um, it's, it's a national funded uh, offer, the university offer, and, and that's where the national funding goes. But I just wondered, Miriam, if you've got any words of wisdom for so many of our fabulous young people who have headed off, attempting to continue their further and higher education, um, only to find it's, um, it's proving to be a bit disappointing for them this year. Yeah, well, yes, it, it's a very different kind of landscape and a good question. Um, a very different landscape for young people at the moment in those in those settings. I think um, it is making those connections. It, and thinking about how you do that in different ways using the virtual media and of course on that's very much what they're having to do using virtual means to communicate and keep in touch um, and 
it, it's making sure that you're not so if you are sit feeling vulnerable um in those situations that you you still make those connections with those people that matter those really the things that keep you safe the resilience factors that keep you safe um you also do things that ground you so it's really important to do things that ground us and take those moments just to take to reflect um and reflect on where we are what we call mindful activities are really important to do when you're in those sorts of situations um, it's a very different landscape for those young people who are in in higher education and further education at the moment um, um, but it's really important that they have that experience too because that's part of that development of being a teenager and a young person developing into being an independent young person and learning how to what those factors are that support you to be well and to realize that you're not in it alone that other people are also there um, and I, you know we know that some, many of you are very good at doing that at reaching out um, and it's encouraging those noticing those signs in your peers as well noticing when when you haven't heard from somebody for a while uh, that you would usually hear from reaching out to them themselves because as 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 you develop as you know you know you as young people tend to seek support from each other rather than us as adults so it's really important that you look out for each other as well Thank you, Miriam. And um, I think that that does really, that really reminds us that um, for young people, so many of the worries of, of being at university are, are connected to getting into debt and um, to not having um, maybe enough of a, a future visual that they can see at the moment in terms of what that might look like. So the purpose of going and, and having that interaction with other students can be a really important part of it. But the, you know, the process of, of, of at least achieving the study, it's a good year to be busy. And even though that online learning isn't as rewarding as being in your group and, and being in your, in your space of, of, of having that full university experience, I genuinely think it's a really good year to be busy, to spend the time studying. We'll leave it for others than us, the central government and lawyers, no doubt, to work out whether there should be any actual compensation for the for the fees paid but i think submerge yourself and immerse yourself as much in the learning as you can and see it as a really good year to be t paying attention and, and giving yourself that opportunity to study but of course not everybody has that opportunity to study in quite the same way and we know that for some of our families during this time the capacity to have adequate technology it has been difficult and so um Ted, age 16, asks us, how do you plan to support students who did not have access to adequate technology at home during the first lockdown and subsequently have fallen behind in the curriculum? Could come to Andrew Parry if I might. Difficult, important question, Andrew. Absolutely. And I think the first thing we have to acknowledge is the Herculean efforts that went in from our, our schools across the county to ensure that education in, in some format was able to continue throughout the lockdown period. And for some of our um, children, young people, that was still taking place in, in a school setting as we would understand it. And that was largely because of their particular needs or the fact that they came from families where their parents and, and carers were, were key, identified as key workers. So a big hats off to our schools for maintaining that. But we also saw that the real, very real challenge that families had of uh, conducting their schoolwork in a home setting uh, and that also happened to coincide with the family members themselves also having to work from home. Now we understand in some areas that did cause issues around things like the bandwidth of your broadband and some areas are better served by broadband in Dorset than others which is why the reality of working from home and using those technologies is a bit mixed pictures and it does even vary one household to another. So I'm, I, I, I totally get what's been said about this question here and, and the issue behind it. Where do we move that on to? Well, of course, it is ultimately the responsibility of our schools to help students to catch up on areas that they have missed in the curriculum. And they are doing that. I, you know, every conversation I've had with a head teacher has, has made it very clear to us that they are going to do everything they possibly can to maintain those that are on track and to help those that need to get back on track into that place. But the one thing all the teachers said to us right at the start of lockdown was, look, 
please families look after your kids well, let's get through this period of lockdown let's move into a better place and whatever we need to do educationally we will do to help them catch up and that's the place where we're now at so um you know a lot's gone on there was there was certainly some resource put behind it so you you may have read about for example that over 1300 laptops and pieces of it equipment were um, distributed to uh, children who were and young people who were identified as having inadequate IT systems available to them. Um, and that's been you know, one of the big successes in helping people maintain an educational setting uh, during lockdown. And I know that's not the whole picture. There were other things done as well, but that's just one example of how seriously we took this matter. Um, and you know, if, if you do find yourself at this point in time where you still feel that you have lost some ground on your educational setting, please ensure that you have those conversations with your teachers, staff, the pastoral care teams and everybody else that's in that school community environment that, that uh, will help you get back to the place that we need you to get to and you want to get to, to thrive and to be the best you possibly can. So we do have, following on from that, um, we have signed off our, our new three year children, young people and families plan. Um, that is a partnership arrangement. So we are going to be working with schools and all sorts of other partner agencies to really help and support our children, young people and families going forward. Um, and details of that are available online if you want to have a look at all the exciting things that we've got planned for you. But I, I promise you, you know, every storm passes and so will this one. And I really do hope we have calmer, calmer waters ahead of us. But thank you, a fantastic question. I really appreciate it. Thank, thank you, Andrew Parry, really, really helpful answer. So thank you again. It's um, a really, really great opportunity to just reflect for a moment and think about, you know, even now as we're just coming through this and as Andrew reminds us in a, that reassuring way that it will pass. I was, somebody said to me today, you know, one of the things that's difficult about keeping keeping upbeat in the school at the moment is you don't see the smiling faces in the corridor because everybody's wearing masks. And you know it, the whole atmosphere, the whole environment is a difficult space to be. So we will support our schools in remaining as joyful as they can. They're tired too. You're all tired. It's really important to remember that and recognise that actually just just getting by safely and comfortably together right now. Catch up will come. Catch up will be there. Computers and other pieces of equipment are continuing to come out of central government into schools where if children are having to now work at home because there's been an outbreak. So we're still accessing new computers every every week virtually and getting those out to vulnerable groups where we need to. And the catch up support will come too. There's a clear plan for that uh, from the announcements made this week. So I think that's, um, we can see the future and um, it will be bright and it will be in a much better place for us if we just take ourselves steady as we get there. Because it's been a hard, really hard period of time for many people, but particularly hard for anybody who's lost family or friends during this time to COVID or otherwise. It has been a terrible time to lose somebody. It's always a terrible time to lose somebody, but the, the absence of ritual and being able to be with people during this time and, and yet experiencing bereavement is incredibly challenging and incredibly painful for so many members of our community and they all remain in our hearts and minds all the time. And Finley 15 tells us about some pieces of research that the Participation People Group have been doing that's shown that bereavement significantly impacts young people. We, we, we really know that, don't we? Both before and since the start of the pandemic and asks us what support is offered and what can be done and improved in how we talk about and support people with bereavement. This is a question really close to my heart. I often feel that um, culturally we've still got a way to go to be able to, to bear to keep talking, keep asking. People aren't over bereavement in a short period of time. It goes on and it's important to keep that conversation going. But I wondered, Miriam, if you might just briefly, because we've talked, I think, already about some of the services that are available, mm. But just briefly tell us a little bit about managing bereavement in these times. Mm. And absolutely, it's a you know I think it's a really pertinent question because as you say, it's not just about the increased deaths around the COVID nineteen, but but people experience death all the time, and it is part of of life. It's a not a pleasant experience, but it is it's part of that normal, typical human being human that we experience it and I think you're you know right Teresa that actually here we are 
we've still got some way to be comfortable with that in many of our organisations. So we, the Wellbeing for Education programme, which I've mentioned already, does it includes some guidance on how to support young people in schools around talking about bereavement and being open about your feelings about it um, and how and the, those normal processes that we would you know you know we would normally re regard as important in terms of those memorials and what you do those gatherings to celebrate somebody's life have been restricted as well at these times and it's been very it's been quite a challenging time for people who have and I'm talking you know from personal experience as well where I have very close friends who who've been in these situations during this time and it's been very challenging for them to have to deal with that and for young people we know it's it's a it, it's part of life so therefore we would say it's not to do with mental health it's part of well-being bereavement is very much part of well-being so those organizations like cooth and chat health which are those early intervention services are there very much for young people around supporting them around bereavement we have provided um we provided more information to schools and we worked with an uh, organization called mosaic which is a local charity that supports children and, and families who will have experienced bereavement and they've done a lot more into schools as well providing leaflets and guidance online guidance um, supporting the workforce it within a, around young people to be comfortable in talking about it to be open and honest about what it feels like um, and to just and to be able to support those young people around those emotions and because it, it's about getting through it we know it, it's always there but it's it's we have this analogy about grief doesn't ever really go away it doesn't get smaller but life grows around it so that's how you know there's some um, research about how that is a much better way of thinking about grief it doesn't actually get smaller but life grows bigger around it and that's exactly the kind of language that we do use when we're talking to schools and families and we have also um, in offered families and parents a, hot, a helpline, a telephone helpline, um, which was for families to use to be able to support children, their own children in these sorts of situations as well. So understanding very much from the research, as you say, Finley, that we know that it is it, it is a significant factor for children just as, as much as it is for adults. Children have emotions and feelings too. Thank you, Miriam. Andrew. Thank you. I, I, I wanted to reflect on, on what I thought was a very positive and practical measure by one of our one of the schools um, that I'm aware of where a young person uh, it, it's a, a school supported by analysis and the young person concerned uh, recently lost a uh, beloved great grandparent um, not due to COVID but for other reasons and they were feeling very unhappy and uncertain about this. Um, and in conversation with the school, uh, they made arrangements for the uh, local uh, vicar to uh, have a, a, a Zoom conversation with the young person and to say a prayer together and to bring a sense of spiritual well-being uh, that was required in that young person's life. So those of faith, will, those, there are those support mechanisms there. Please make um, your schools uh, aware of that and your communities aware of that. Um, and it can bring great comfort in those most terrible times of bereavement uh, for, for those of faith and those of, of spiritual well-being, because there are similar there are similar sort of supports in place for those who don't have a, an affiliated faith, um, but still need that sense of, of uh, bringing together a, a, an understanding of the uh, bereavement you're experiencing. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Andrew and Miriam. I think um, I think it's going to be really important when we're through this that we have some national processing around grieving because we've we've lost people, but we've got, some people have also lost some hope, some opportunity, some promise of experience. People have had their first babies not in the way that they wanted to. People who have got married not in the way they wanted to really. People who have let people go not in the way they wanted to children and young people having a school experience not in the way they wanted to. And all of that kind of global grief, I think we'll find some 
I'm hopeful for some really positive ways of really coming together around that community spiritual leadership that Andrew talks about. You find it in all sorts of places and people, don't you? The people who can really help and guide us through. So um, I look forward to thinking about that with young people as we come out the other side, because I am an eternal optimist, as you know, but the next question is one of the very many that um, is one of the great questions of this evening. And so what if? What if we don't get the vaccine? Next C18, what if we don't get the vaccine? Will there be any sanctions to not having the vaccine? And if young people are at the back of the queue for the vaccine, will there be restrictions on young people for longer? So I'm going to ask um, Dr. Forbes to get out his um, crystal ball and see if he can tell us what that future holds. And there are some things that might be quite certain there, but there's a lot of uncertainty too, I know, Forbes. So I wonder what you'd say to that. OK, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The question. It's um, you're absolutely right. It's very, very topical. The conversation around um, vaccine. Um, in short, if we don't have a vaccine, then we will have to find a way to live with the virus, and that's what we're doing at the moment. So the many changes that we've all made have been as a result of um, the virus, and in the main, not having the vaccine. And the focus will be about getting the numbers of infections down and keeping them down. And similar to what we are now seeing, it will involve mass scale testing and a huge amount of human contact tracing that we're bringing in. So we can very much understand how we can live with the virus. And, you know, every day we are learning about the virus and how to live with it. Having said all that, I think we will have a vaccine. I'm very confident that we will have a vaccine. We've got the best scientific brains in the world working as hard as they can and really have done miraculous work so far to produce what the, the information that we have at this point in time. So no, we don't have a licensed vaccine at this point in time, but we are very, very hopeful of a license uh, being granted in the near future. And presently within the NHS, we're working extremely hard to make sure that when that vaccine is available, we are ready to give it to people. And that is that is very good and very good news, considering all the, the bad news, if you like, that we have had in, in, in recent months. Are young people at the back of the queue? Well, actually, young people in many ways are at the front of all of this because they suffer the least as a result of COVID and uh, are largely unaffected, as we've heard earlier from, from, from Rachel. So with any immunisation or vaccination, uh, you have to focus on those most at risk first. So if we just use normal immunisation campaigns for children, they are the ones at risk of childhood illnesses, so they get the vaccine. And it has to be the same for COVID as we do with the flu vaccine. But the plans for COVID immunisation are much wider than we would normally do for, for other, other vaccines. So unfortunately, restrictions are likely to have to stay in place um, to control the virus until enough people have had the vaccine. But we are planning for uh, that to be implemented by April of next year. So actually, that's not long. Now, I can't promise that will happen. None of us can guarantee that at this point in time. But I think we can be hopeful of that and optimistic that uh, that that will happen. And I know certainly speaking to all my colleagues uh, within the health system, and I'll be honest, many of whom have retired and are volunteering to come back to help uh, 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 administer this vaccine. They are very willing to give their time. They see this as a really important thing uh, to do for the population and quite frankly, um, for the for the world uh, that that we live in, I think the other thing just to mention is that we're uh, back to that. What we're learning all the time is that new treatments are developing all the time. So the outcomes for people who have been uh, very sick through COVID are improving, and there's an increasing number of treatments being developed, largely in terms of drugs, but also just in terms of how we manage uh, patients. 
um, both outside of hospital and in hospital, which which is, is uh, very positive news as as well. So in short, I think uh, we can be positive. I would suggest everyone please follow the rules, no matter what tier you're in, and that applies to young people equally as old people, because that will help us to be able to be more positive more quickly. Thank you, Forbes. That's um, that's really helpful message, and and I think su such a lot of clarity and yet optimism in there too. And I think that you know we're all keen, aren't we, just to get to that springtime, um, get there safely, as many of us as possible. So you're absolutely right. Let's keep those um, restrictions in place and keep our own behaviour managed, and and know that we'll get. And I've just got a lovely vision of an army of um, retired NHS staff getting getting near us with the with a uh, with a needle, I'd be first in the queue. We just go absolutely publicly saying I absolutely would sign up for a vaccine, and I think we should all um, commit to that. I think there's huge, huge, fantastic ability in our scientists uh, have worked so hard to get us to this point, and all those fabulous people that have been doing the trials already. Lots and lots of university students, lots and lots of young people um, already have um, trialing those vaccines long before they're actually approved for use. So. A fabulous, fabulous um, offer there. Coming to our last question now, and we've spent nearly an hour together this evening, which is um, it's been a good hour, knowing that you're on the other side of the screen, um, either in real time now or watching it at some point um, in leisure, the young people, that's really good to know. And Phoebe, tomorrow, Phoebe 15, Phoebe tells us that she has an English exam tomorrow, and because of the lockdown, she'd missed five mock exams and so feels pretty out of practice, really. I appreciate that. Today, she had a talk from her teachers about how not to worry about exams because everyone was stressing out. She wants to know what will be done to ensure that students taking exams get a fair grade and that no one is penalised for a bad mock exam grade in their final grades. So a lot in that question, Phoebe. Before I hand you on to Andrew Parry, who's going to give a response, I just want to say good luck. And it's it's an important exam, but there's the rest of your life too. So good luck tomorrow, Andrew. Thank you. And the question is very, very similar to one I was able to ask my counterparts across the southwest at a recent meeting. And the collective opinion we arrived at is we need to know early how the exam systems are going to work. It's so important that everybody is given as a greater opportunity as possible to understand the mechanisms and that they are fair in their outcomes for, for our young people. Um, I have a lot of sympathy with those who feel anxious taking exams. It is an entirely natural feeling to have a sense of uh, anticipation and a slight anxiety about sitting an exam, whether that's a formalised exam in, in a classroom setting, your driving test or whatever else it happens to be in life. It is entirely natural to want to do the best you possibly can and to be recognised for that. So in terms of where we expect this to go now, um, it, it does sit with government. The government and the exam boards are in discussions about this and how best to proceed with it. But collectively, everybody's of the same opinion, which is whatever the outcome, wherever we go with it, it has to be deemed to be fair and that and recognize those attributes. So, you know, if you've had a bad mark, a, a mock exam, let's say, it doesn't quite go to plan for whatever reason. Is that really right that you should be held back or marked down when the rest of your work clearly demonstrates an ability? And I hope we will see in the final markings that fairness is reflected. When will we know more about the plans for the markings of next year's exam? It will now be after Christmas, so it is a little bit watch this space. It's very much on our radar as Dorset Council, um, and I know it's on, on you know, the top of the agendas for your schools as well. Um, and as soon as we know, I'm sure our, we will be trying to communicate that message to all of you as well. But thank you and good luck with your mock. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. And um, thank you to all of our fabulous young people from participation people who have posed us with such 
Such great questions and um, yeah, stretching questions, difficult questions, upsetting at times and, and leading us to some really optimistic answers too. So um, I'd like to thank uh, Councillor Andrew Perry, Dr Forbes Watson, Rachel Partridge and Miriam Lee for joining the panel and being able to answer those questions. And, and I'd want to just uh, end the session with that message of optimism. There will be storms. And we're in one right now, but it will pass. And as we go into 2021, we will have learned a lot about ourselves and a lot about each other. And we won't be always in this place. I'm confident about that. But right now, bear in mind Dr Forbes Watson's message. This is the time. If you need help to ask for it, reach out, look after each other. Think about what Miriam was saying about this is the time to think about your pals. And if they're being other than they'd normally be, reach out. If somebody's been bereaved, talk about the person that's lost. It's always welcome. Thank you for your questions. Look forward to seeing you in the real world at some point in the future. Bye bye.